It's been a wonderful week, folks. Welcome to PM Personality Profile. My guest tonight, he's a development economist. He's a researcher as well. He's worked with many firms, including the IEA. He's currently the director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ESA, and also a lecturer at the University of Ghana, Professor Peter Corte. The Ghana say Peter. Yes, <laughs> Good to exactly. see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Do you have a Ghana name? Yes, I was named after my grandfather, so I'm Niaite. Niaite. Yeah. So, Professor Peter Niaite Kwate. But the Niaite is in a wardrobe locked. <laughs> I, I, I use the Peter Kwate. Where is the uh, key? Yeah. <laughs> um, often. That's, that's but how, how have you been, Prof? I've been good. Life has been good. Um, it's been hard work and also very rewarding, mm. I must say. Okay. Yes, um, God has been good to us. And of course, uh, looking through your educational background, I realized that you attended Wesley Grammar. Then I knew that you must be a full-blown Accra boy. Is that correct? It is correct. <laughs> a fully blown Accra boy from Astra. Okay. That's Jamestown. Okay. And uh, yes, I went to Wesley Grammar. Accra Academy and then University of Ghana before I went to the UK for further studies. So so both parents are Ghana? Yeah, both parents are, are Ghana. From Asane, all of them? No, my fa father is from Asane mm -hmm. and my mom is from Botiano. Okay. Yes, so, yeah. Kole and Show me, oh, correct? Sure. Yeah, me. Me, huh? Yes. I feel like uh, the guy will say, hey, and Show me is true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, nice. So, you were born and bred in a car, yes, buttered sure. cheese Butter, here. Yeah, Where yeah. exactly? Um, we lived in Dakuma okay. uh, most of the time. Mm. And uh, we also had a farm in the Bronkafu region. So, we have a cocoa farm and uh, my mom was a trader. So on holidays sometimes, uh, we go for holidays in the Brongafu region mm -hmm. and come back, but uh, based solely in Accra. And as if you are doing the 83, early 80s, you know, when the hunger period, mm -hmm. many people went back to, to farming, you know, so uh, every time we go on holidays, I go back to the Brongafu region. And, you know, it was, it was fun, it was good, you know. So that's how I learned. I could speak Chi very well. I could, mm. You know, I blend very well the Ghana. Speak the very good Chi. Oh, yeah, I do. I and do. and uh, what, what's a Ghana boy doing in the Bono for region? At the time, Coco, um, uh, my father of blessed memory, he died at the age of 92. Um, Coco was very uh, prominent, very, you know, the rich farmers cultivated Coco. Okay. And he wanted so your to, father was a rich man? Yeah, not really, but. <laughs> <laughs> he, he ventured into cocoa. Okay. Yeah, so um, at times we go there to, to farm okay. and come back. Yeah. Okay, so you spent some of your time purely vacations. Vacations, In exactly. the Bono Ahafu region. Exactly. How, how was it like? It was good. I mean, you could see village life. You could see, you know, we had fresh products, uh, food. You know, you tasted life, not just the Accra, the hustle and bustle of life, but, you know, village life, cool, quiet fresh air and, and and so you know I could relate to a lot of things some of the things we read in books you okay. know when you travel out there you see the countryside and you relate to whatever is, is happening I've been to the north when you're traveling down from Accra the vegetation will tell you the richness or how rich the people are mm -hmm. so you know from here you go to the eastern region you see the vegetation, you see the food they sell along the roadside, it tells you something about the people. Mm -hmm. Then you go to Ashanti, Bronga Hafo, Tichiman, then as you get to the north, you see the things they display by the roadside, it tells yeah. you charcoal, so it tells you they are not very rich. Right. So I, I've really learned it by um, blending village life or countryside life mm. with city life. Okay, so let's talk about city life. Mm. I mean, where precisely were you? Uh, did you grow up in Dansuman? Dakuman. In, in Dan Dakuman. Dakuman. I grew up at Dakuman. How was Dakuman life like? <laughs> well, it's not the richest neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I, I was a quiet type. I, I, I grew up there. I saw uh, people. I related to people. But um, it was a poor, relatively poor community, I must say. Mm. So you didn't see much of development. So you see... Um, the harsh life you see 
uh, people behave in a certain way, you know. But I think I was very studious, and, and for me, I didn't relate very well with the people I kept to my books. And, and that was, but it's a great community with different, diverse backgrounds. So you learn to grow out of poverty. For yeah. me, that's what I took out of. You could grow out of poverty. Mm. And so you know what poverty is, how people, poor people live. And if you grow out of poverty, how you should manage your resources mm -hmm. not to uh, return to poverty. Did, did that inform your, your choice? of research areas because I realize that you've also done research into poverty and all that. I mean, growing up from that area, I mean, some of the things you saw, mm. did they inform your choice of becoming a researcher and also researching into these areas? It did, it did significantly mm. because you, you, you live with poor people, you've seen poor people and, and how to get them out of poverty, what it means, uh, inequality means to people, how to prevent civil unrest, how to make people happy, yep. you know, what are their challenges. It could be health, it could be education, sometimes even lack of information, you know. There are, there are brilliant young guys out there. Their mentality is mainly to travel, you know, but if we could educate them and show to them that, look, there's more to just traveling. Yes, you could travel to further education, but you could earn a living decently whilst in Ghana. I think we need to uh, motivate and educate some of these young ones. Mm. So you did make friends in your area. W what, which part of Dakman did you live? Because I know that you area. Know the area. Uh, there's a place called Circle Station. Circle Station. Yes, oh. Dakum official town. Okay. You know, that, that, so you that did area. make friends around? Oh, I did. I did make friends. I had friends from school. Um, I had friends uh, from the locality. So but which school did you attend for Wesley Grammar? Before Wesley Grammar, I went to a school at Abeka. Okay. Called St. Thomas Preparatory School. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, St. Thomas. St. Thomas okay. Preparatory School. Near Harrow. Mm. I mean, if you know yeah. Harrow, yes, St. Thomas. Yes, yeah. Harrow was Haru also on top. Harrow was also on top. Yeah. Harrow was much bigger than mm. St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then behind it, you find a Catholic public school as okay. well. That is where I took my common entrance examination. Okay. And, and, then, and, and, and what kind of friends did you make in Dakuman? I know there were a lot of Muslims around that area. Mm. Equally, I mean, it's like a cosmopolitan area. You mm -hmm. have others, you have guns, but particularly a lot more Muslims in that yeah, area. Yeah. What kind of friends did you make? What influence did they have on you? And how it, did it even impact on your growing up? My bosom friend at the time uh, was a guy, okay. and uh, he attended Wesley Grammar School. Okay. So we related very well. I had a few Muslim friends, but not um, too close. Um, because I was studious, so I, I associated with very people who are studious. Okay. Um, I had a Muslim friend, but he didn't leave Dakuma. Mm. He lived at Abeka. Okay. Uh, he's now in the U.S. Yeah, but I had Muslim friends and, and uh, friends from the other tribes. Okay. But my friendship basically depends on people who are studious. If you are studious, then you are my friend. Okay. I like I like book. I uh -huh. like studying. Yeah, okay. that's that's for me. Okay, mm. so if you wanted to gallivant, I mean, you, they won't find you there. No, they won't find me. I mean, so we, we greet the, each other, we are so, you know, All but, the expeditions, you know. going to play football, doing all those things, you didn't participate in any of that? Well, playing football, so local football, you know, uh, within the area, we had a park, we played football, but not to go to the community where they had a community park okay. and played football. And I didn't really like that because... Uh, oftentimes, I mean, you, you know that, Kuman, sometimes after matches, they fight. Yes. And <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't think I, I, I like those kinds of environments. Yeah. I'm a peaceful, the peaceful, quiet okay. type, so I don't like where there is trouble. Okay. I, I try to stay away from trouble. Yeah. I like football a lot, but mm. where I see that there could be trouble, I avoid those areas. So then, after St. Thomas, then you graduated to Wesley Guam, Wesley West G. G. West G. <laughs> I must say, West G wasn't my first choice. Okay. I wanted to go to Accra Academy. That was my dream school. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I was told I'm, I missed the cut-off point by one mark. Okay. Um, I didn't know anybody in my uh, family. I grew up with my other siblings most okay. of the time. They were uh, bank managers and okay. but, uh, we didn't know anybody. I later met friends who got lower than, uh, including those I attended school with at St. Thomas. 
who made it to Accra Academy. But so I, why you? I, I don't know. I, 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 I was told I missed it by, by a mark. So I went to Western Grammar. Well, it's, it's, it was good too because uh, every misfortune they say is a blessing. A I was among the top 10 people given scholarship. Oh, wow. So I didn't pay a dime. Uh -huh. And even the school owed me after. After <laughs> <It's> <laughs> uh, a completion. Yeah, after the completion. <laughs> so they, they refunded part of their money wow. yeah, yeah, to, to me. Um, then from Brazil Grammar, I went to Accra Academy. It was good. I met good friends. And, and Accra Academy is big, it's, it has a lot of. Uh, students, so the network is, is great. Alumni is, is great. Um, I I think I enjoyed Accra Academy, but that's where I wanted to be, and uh, it worked out very well. It turned out that I uh, became the best accounting student. Oh wow! Yeah, um, at our time. So I I received a prize. Uh, it was an Akoku Sapon mm -hmm. at the time who um, gave me the prize in accounting. Okay. Yeah. I'm not an accountant, unfortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> because now I think I I yeah, towing the I'm towing the economics economics yeah line. Path. Yeah. Is that to say you didn't enjoy Wesley Grammar too? I did, I okay. did enjoy Wesley Grammar very well, and in fact, we we, we have a um, alumni as well, um, of which I'm leading the the, the, group. the, the group. Yeah, okay. I've been leading them since I started up. Okay, and I've been leading the group. I I did enjoy, mm. but. Um, you know, when you, everybody has like a dream. This is my dream school. Definitely. You know, so that is where I wanted, to, to, uh, go to, I wanted to go. But I enjoy Wesley Gama so much. That is why having left Wesley Gama, okay. I continue to support them. Uh, we organized a fundraising dinner. I don't know whether you attended. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah. So the first lady, we, were, we had it at Alisa attended. Hotel. Okay. First lady uh, was present okay. and we raised money to do so many things. And there's a lot we are doing for, for the school. The school. Yeah. Oh, thanks mm -hmm. so much for the good work. Mm -hmm. But um, what kind of a student were you then? I was studious, but also very playful. Okay. I, not playful in terms of not taking my academic serious, but mm -hmm. I rely, re, um, related to people very well, um, always cracking jokes and you know, sharing jokes and you know, I think I was, so I was quite known amongst my my year group. Okay. Yeah. So when you finally left Wesley Grammar and you went to Akaka, did you see the treatment to be different? Well, no. At time the sixth form was mixed as well. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but still very few females. Okay. Uh, whereas in Wesley Grammar we had a lot of females, so you knew how to relate to the opposite sex. So when we come to go to Akraka, we were well behaved already. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I prefer mixed school to okay. boys' school because I think you learn how to relate very well so with, the, with the opposite up, sex. Yep. I mean, it's just that when you go through a mixed school and you excel, it tells you you can excel in, in every environment. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I think Wasi Gama gave me that opportunity to know how to relate very well to the with the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. so Akraka. Okay was just for two years and I, I realized in some cases we knew, you know, with, with the background in West Virginia, we had very good teachers in certain subjects, okay. like um, economics, for instance. We had a very great teacher, uh, one Mr. Uh, Akrofi Kwaku. Okay. Uh, he, could, he was very dedicated, he could teach us, sometimes for free, during holidays. Wow. Yeah, wow. he was coming. He, he, will come and teach us for free without taking any anything. So we really understood economics and that gave me that foundation. Okay. When I got to Accra, I realized not just me, our colleagues realized our economics tutor was not up to the standard we, we have been taught. So we eventually boycotted his class okay. and arranged private lessons okay. uh, with uh, somebody from WAS, one Mr. Chris Quay. So that's how I managed to pass my economy because if I had relied on a teacher, wouldn't have. So that's the difference. You find in some of the big schools very good teachers, but you could also find lousy ones. Okay. Yeah, and they do well because sometimes they have extra classes or private tuition. But mm. sometimes it's not always the case that the big schools or you don't have everything. They also have their own challenges. Their own challenges. So from um, Accra, then you went to the University of Ghana, yes. then to I think Warwick, yes. 
Yes. And then Manchester. Exactly. Tell me about the experience. So from Accra to University of Ghana, where I read uh, economics with political science, and then uh, after graduation, I was picked. I was among the seven selected by the department to mm. undertake their national service in the department. Okay. Um, after that, I enrolled on the MPhil or master's two-year master's program mm -hmm. um, sponsored by the African Economic Research Consortium. And then also my thesis was, I had a scholarship, a uh, uh, bursary funding for my thesis, uh, Ian Omabo scholarship for, for my thesis. Okay. So, to write my thesis. You've had a lot of scholarships. Oh, yes, uh, <laughs> write my thesis. Um, whilst undertaking my national service, my aim was to travel outside the country to study, for further studies. Mm. So I kept trying, but it didn't, they didn't work out. Um, when I was just about completing, actually as part of the master's, we went to Nairobi for three months. Okay. It's all sponsored. So um, we came back, completed the thesis. Just when I was about completing the thesis, I had funding from Warwick. Okay. For a master's degree, master's in quantitative development economics. Oh wow! Whereas at the University of Ghana, I had infill economics. Okay. Yeah. So I managed to get two. I have two master's degrees. Mm. Oh wow! Yeah, and then at Warwick, uh, I I did my best, and then got admitted into Manchester University, um, where with Manchester, I was a research associate. So. As part of the agreement, I was working on the project, but the project was paying my school fees. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's how I managed with that to get my PhD. Okay. Then after graduation, not graduation, after sub submitting my thesis, I mm. got employment to Keele University okay. as a research um, associate. So I worked for one and a half years. And then, but I realized, you know, to get employment, you need to get country contractual, you know, this short term, one year, two years, one year. So they were prepared to renew. But, you know, every now you have to, you know, it's, it's unsettled, certainly, mm -hmm. for me, because mm -hmm. you don't have a long-term permanent job. And I was living in Manchester and driving for well, 40 uh, miles mm. to kill and back on a daily basis. Okay. It was quite stressful with a young family as well. So luckily, the opportunity came up. IEA advertised in the Times no, the Economist newspaper, mm. a magazine, okay. Economist magazine. Okay. So a friend and, uh, and I applied and uh, we were engaged at IEA for about a year. Um, I had to leave IEA because I realized I needed a bit of flexibility. Then, then also, um, if I had stayed there, it couldn't rise to become a professor because it's a research based think tank okay. so you'll be doctor so so and so forever whereas if you join the university you could, you could progress to become articles, articles and, and attend conferences and you know so i i thought um i would do well if if i, I a very great platform mm. in terms of engaging the media you know dissemination information communicating in simple language or terms that the audience could understand yeah. without having to write all the technical papers and not be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. I think IEA gives that platform okay. and I was happy uh, to have worked with the, with the IEA. So um, I then joined the university as a research fellow in 2014, January 2014. Uh, I think by 2018 I became a senior research fellow, 2011 associate professor, 2016 uh, professor, Sublime what some professor. some call full professor, okay. you know, but we say professor. Okay. Yeah. So, since um, 2016, I've been a professor. Uh, wow, congratulations for you. this milestone. But let me take you back to your days of O-level, A-level, and even university in Ghana. What would you say was your biggest challenge during that time? Personally, I think uh, finance was a problem. I, although I was on scholarship, and I, I didn't come from a, a rich background. So you saw uh, people being driven to school. Uh, you saw others uh, being pampered. You saw, you know, you know, people had all the nice, nice things, but you couldn't. You had a basic 
Okay. Uh, but in our time, we were made to be content to what we had. Okay. And I think that also motivated me to study hard. Mm. In fact, that's why I said, I'm for me, I'm studious. Because I, I saw that it's only through education that can, can break that chain. Yep. And, and, you know, for many people, um, you go to parliament, you go to wherever you go to, mm. if you speak to them and they tell you their background, it tells you that it's as a result of education yeah. that people have broken the poverty chain and they are doing so well. And when you go through that grill, that, you know, from that level and build your profile, build your capacity, and you go up there, I'm sure you, you, you're able to excel whatever you are put. Mm. Yeah. So what would you describe as your most awkward moment? I mean, you're talking about lack of finance and was there a time that you really felt bad because you didn't have money to do something? Yes, I uh, mentioned one was I, I growing up, you know, we had to sometimes sell things to support our parents mm. or our guardians. So uh, you uh, I've sold a few things, you know, you have to go and sell to come and support home. Okay. And uh, you can combine saying? that with, with <laughs> schooling. Okay. Uh, I've sold soap, I've sold uh, several things, uh, uh, soap, uh, sugar cane, homo, um, what else? I've several. <laughs> you know, anyway. We sold eggs, we sold, mm. yeah, we sold several, several things. So you, you do that. Around the we took them around the neighborhood. Take it to neighborhood to sell and come and support the family. After which, you also have to learn. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that was before secondary school. Mm. Uh, yep. You know, so that, that, that was one. But one area I felt, one day I really felt the pinch was when I had graduated from the university and, uh, you know, the graduation, I wanted, you know, some, you know, show of you know, <laughs> nice suits, big party. That kind of that thing. That kind of thing, you know. <laughs> And I saw some colleagues whose parents have organized, you know, big parties for them, but that, that did not happen it in my case. It didn't happen for you. It didn't happen. Oh. But we did one, one good thing. <laughs> uh, a few of our mates came together. Okay. Um, and we organized a party. At least. Yeah, so it, 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 it just overshadowed that feeling. That feeling. We, we had a good time. Okay. Yeah, and I think that, that, that helped, yeah. Oh, wow. So mm. whilst you were selling those things, as uh, sugar cane, eggs, and mm. those things. Did you ever meet any of your mates? And I know definitely sometimes they would want to make fun of you. I don't say it was common. Okay. It was it was not uncommon. You could see. I also met some of my mates who were, we're selling. Also selling. Uh, there's a lady I saw. I met selling cooking oil. Honestly, I, I couldn't believe because <laughs> when I, I I I thought she was from a very you know. Okay. Good yeah, and she was she proudly walk around. Our neighborhood, and you know, those days it, it was not uncommon to see people doing things to support yeah, their family. Yeah. Farming, backyard farming, people going to the semi urban areas to farm on weekends and come back. It was, it was fun. People mm. did that. So I think that helped with our food security. Yeah. It helped reduce the inequality. So children, as many children, could go to school mm -hmm. because they did something to support. Their parents now this is child labor mm -hmm. so um, I, I recall my wife uh, and I would you know telling our children that they are blessed so they should work hard but these are some of the things we had to do to survive yeah then my last born one of my not the last one of them told mommy but mommy this is child labor <laughs> <laughs> you know the child labor yeah because for them they haven't seen but in our time it was common it was normal it was normal so and sure. that's why we could support our parents to also help us achieve mm. whatever dream they mm. had for us. Professor Peter Niaite Kote, he's my guest tonight. He's a development economist and he's been doing a lot of research into areas including private sector development, development finance, monetary economics, migration and remittances. When I return from this break, he'll be telling us what his job entails and also share findings of some of the researches he's conducted, particularly in poverty analysis. Also, I'll be gauging his mood on Ghana's um, current population. He'll be telling us what this means for the economy and even whether we have what it takes 
to take care of all these people. Stay with me, I'm coming right back. Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to My Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. Welcome back to PM Personality Profile. My guest tonight so remains Professor Niaite Korti, and he is the director of ESA at the University of Ghana. Prof, and share so with me your findings and in all the researches you've done, particularly the one that I'm so much interested is in poverty because the issue of poverty mm. in Ghana and in Africa is something that bothers all of us. Mm. What, what did your finding, uh, your research on, mm. unravel is the gap bridging or widening? Oh, poverty, the, the inequality is widening. Okay. You see, it's very common to find, because even from, from biblical, from the Bible, you see, the rich shall get richer, the poor will so get I'll poorer. Get, and that's what is happening. That's what is happening. Okay. When you grow, the rich get richer. Mm. It's, it's natural. Mm. Because when we grow, and uh, I have a house and I'm renting, my rental, you know, the value of my property goes up, yep. my rent goes up, when the economy grows and I have a business and I employ people, I, I get more profit as an entrepreneur. Yeah. When they grow and I have savings, I earn more on my savings. Okay. So you see how the rich get richer, mm -hmm. the poor Gets get poorer. poorer. Mm -hmm. That is why there has to be a conscious effort to redistribute. Okay. No economy grows without redistributing. Okay. So in the UK, they have milk voucher, they have this... The people get maybe mattress to sleep on. People get houses. They get so many things, you know, because government realizes that it has to make conscious effort to redistribute. Okay. Uh, in Ghana, we have high inequality. If you move to the, from the south to the north, the inequality worsens. Uh, northern part of the country, very high inequality. Yeah. And, and sometimes you blame it on past governments, uh, which uh, have not done enough to lift the people out of poverty. You could also blame it on the northern elite themselves. Okay. Because we see what we call elite capture, okay. where monies and things are paid to help develop certain parts of the country. Mm. But the elite are the ones who manage those resources and they don't get effective, efficient outcomes. They okay. either mismanage or misappropriate or whatever. Mm. So that is how come we perpetuate the poverty inequality situation in uh, the northern part of the country and other parts of the country where inequality is still uh, rife. Okay. You find that poverty has different dynamics. Um, urban poverty is different from rural poverty. Mm -hmm. Urban poverty is sharp, very severe. If you are poor in Accra, you sleep outside with mosquito bites, you might not get food, you know. If you are poor in a village, you get somewhere to lay your head. You get, you can pluck mango or pluck papa or something to eat. You will not starve like if you were poor in Accra. So we need to understand all of this. You need to know where the poor are. Sometimes even uh, it's not homogeneous, very heterogeneous. You go to a place like Nima, you will find people there. You find houses with air conditions, yeah. you know, all over. You yeah. find people driving Porsche cars. <laughs> so we say, I want a poor community, so go to Nima. Uh, you, you might get it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Same, I mentioned Dakuma. You come to Dakuma, you find rich people there, you find poor people. So poverty is very heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. And you need to know all these dynamics yep. if you want to propose policy to, to address them. Otherwise, you go around, I'm going to distribute food. You go and give it to everybody. Yeah. You are subsidizing mm -hmm. the rich yep. as well as the poor. Uh, okay, Same so we need to get it right. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. What's, what's the role of the state in all of this? Yeah, the state is the one who is legally mandated to do the redistribution. Yeah. So the state can use tax policies or other non-tax policies to redistribute. Okay. That is why if you look at the income tax brackets, the more you earn, the more you pay mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of taxes, mm -hmm. pay as you earn, yes. so that the poor will pay less 
And then part of that tax can be used to develop where the poor lives. You know. mm -hmm. Same with other, other, other ways. But unfortunately, for some areas, we haven't done well. Yeah. Because we are not able to ascertain people's income or disaggregate people. So let's say fuel subsidy. Why should you subsidize people drive? When we subsidize, we subsidize for everybody. Yeah. So those driving the SUVs uh, get a subsidy. Mm -hmm. The poor who take trotro would also get the subsidy. Know, so we are subsidizing electricity subsidy. People sleep with air conditioners on their houses, they are subsidized. The poor has a bulb or very basic, you know, he or she is also subsidized. So we have to find a way of redistributing so, so that the poor can get more. Yeah. Uh, of course, the rich pay taxes and whatever, they, they enjoy some benefits, but the redistribution has to be done in a better way. Mm. Are we ever going to get um, the gap bridged? It can be done if we, we are not in the short term. What we have to be conscious of to, 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 to do it, mm. you know, by managing the resources uh, properly. If we manage our resources efficiently, then mm. uh, certainly we will ensure that we develop the undeveloped areas. Okay. We provide jobs. It's when we create more jobs, then certainly uh, the poor get employed and gradually the inequality would uh, be reduced. Then okay. also taxation. We use taxation to correct the uh, imbalance. Let me gauge your mood on um, the preliminary report of the population and housing census that we conducted recently. They say it's 30.8 million mm. Ghanaians now. What does this mean for the economy? Well, we, we are growing. Um, over a decade, we have increased our population by the 6.8 million or so. Now, if you calculate on average, the growth rate per annum is about 2.1%. Mm -hmm. Previously, it was around 2.7%. And I think we are on the right trajectory because um, as your economy um, grows, develops, as, as we become more enlightened, and also we also face some hardship here and there. People now give birth to children that they, their resources could allow them to take care, to of. Take care of. So previously, the average uh, family size was 4 points. 7 or 4.8. Okay. Now I think it's coming down because you really have to look after them. Definitely. Uh -huh. So the growth rate is declining. Mm -hmm. Growth in population is, is declining. Yeah. It is a good signal. Mm -hmm. Besides, our per capita income is about 3% growth. Yeah. Per capita income growth. In other words, our GDP, if we share it equally, what yeah. you will take, what I will take, is growing at a rate of 3%. Okay. If our population is growing at 2.7%, it means we are adding very little for investment. Okay. So if our population growth rate is declining, it's good. It's good. Mm. Except that it has to, there should be a threshold. Okay. If you fall below a certain level, then we have to import manpower. Mm. Mm, like some Western okay. countries, when mm. population declines up to a point, they okay. have to import manpower. But mm. I think it's good. The, the growth rates we are do, do we have what it takes to take care of these people? I mean, when we were at 30 million, we were struggling. Now mm. there's an additional eight. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we'll struggle them more if we don't, we don't. The good thing is that our economy is growing. We are recording positive growth rates. Mm. Uh -huh. So we need to accelerate the growth rate, just like I said. Okay. So that the margin between per capita income growth and population growth gets wider. Yeah. So that we, our per capita income grows faster than our population growth. If we do that, then, of course, we can be able to take care of the population. But, but what development inferences can you draw from Accra being the most populous region now? Yeah, because of migration. Accra is the capital. People, the caliber of people who migrate, who have moved, we need okay. to look at that data. It's normally the average, somebody would call the normal Ghanaian, okay. you know, the average Ghanaian, okay. you know, the... The poor, the less privileged, they want to come and seek better opportunities. Mm. That is why you see Accra has become like the central pole yeah. where everybody is trying to. Don't think if you want visa, you want connection, you know, that is they put it to travel. Yeah. Your chances of getting that in Accra is better than okay. in other places mm. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, the embassies are all here. Mm. All the, you know, so we have decentralization, but it's political 
decentralization. Financial decentralization is still centered. I mean, it hasn't happened much. Mm -hmm. The finances, everything is in Accra. So we haven't really done what we should do. You know, I think there is a lot of room for improvement in terms of proper decentralization. Mm -hmm. If we decentralize and there are jobs in the districts and regions, a lot of people will stay behind. Mm -hmm. But where the opportunities are more in Accra, then you see uh, a lot of migration. What's your assessment of Ghana's development pattern, I mean, since independence? I, I think it's been mixed. You know, sometimes we, we seem to complain, and I sit back and look at where we are coming from and see where we have reached. And I realize, look, we, I think we should be not content, but I think we should appreciate how far we have come. Okay. Um, of course, there are a lot of mismanagement, there is a lot of challenges we still face. Mm. But that wouldn't go away uh, in a year or two. You know, but we have really come far. One of the days, if you want to communicate, like uh, to communicate with you, I need to come to your office. Mm -hmm. Now you can just pick a mobile phone and call. Oh, I ask you to join to by To join Zoom by technology, now Zoom technology, you know, and so you can talk to somebody globally in seconds, you can yeah. connect. Yep. Uh, there are several things we do now. You can call your fishmonger at Winneba to bring you fish. Fish, yep. You know, transportation. Previously, you couldn't even get transport. The way we struggle to get trotro is the, the macho guys who are able to get on the trotro. <laughs> the, 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 the fittest. <laughs> the women were pushed aside. And now at least there's more transportation. There's okay. more transport system and better transport system. Mm. Even electricity supply. We have better electricity supply. And I could go on and on, education, previously only few schools or colleges, you know, now it's all over. There's a lot of room for improvement, I must say. But okay. I, I, I admit and I think I appreciate the fact that we have really come a long way mm. uh, in terms of even in road infrastructure. You drive on certain roads and compared to some years back, we, we didn't have all of this. Mm. I think we, our leadership should do more because we expect more of them. Uh, um, like they say, Oliver Twist, we ask for more. Mm. Uh, but I think we have really come, come a long way okay. as a country. Uh, as a development economist, what about Ghana's economic growth worries you? Well, what worries me is that we are growing, but we, we have uh, what we term the jobless growth. Mm -hmm. um, we are growing, but the sectors that are growing are not employing as much as we expect. Um, over the past couple of years, things have changed slightly. So you see manufacturing growing, you see agri growing. But those are the sectors that employ the most. Mm -hmm. But in the past, used to, some years back, it used to be services retail, wholesale, you know, those kinds of services, selling, I don't think that is sustainable. And then, of course, the banking sector. But yeah. how many people are employed in the banking or financial sector? And when the financial sector went down, you saw the, the trade effect. Mm. That's why we need to diversify our economy. Now I see manufacturing growing, I see agri also growing. We need to do more, add value to um, agri and also promote our manufacturing base. Growing up, I at the university, when I finished, I, I, one thing I enjoyed was being a research assistant, where you go around with questionnaires to interview industry players, industry owners. And so not industrial area. I used to comb the whole place in mm. Now you go there, most of them have been turned into either churches or warehouse or mm -hmm. something. Yep. Our, all our industries are gone. And it's quite disheartening. I think, for me, that is an area we need to embrace. Mm. Like, so the concept of one district, one factory, for me, is good. But if we have to do more of that so that we, every district has one or two factories that will produce locally made products, add value mm. and export. Mm. You've always been an advocate for diversification. I mean, how do we achieve this? That's, we, you see, when we um, discovered oil, any politician that spoke, oh, once we start producing oil, our problems will be gone. Mm -hmm. it's, that's not a panacea for... It's not for, automatic. It's not automatic. Yep. Um, 
we have discovered oil, but how much are we earning from oil? Because we have not invested yeah. much into the oil sector. Mm. And especially getting the Ghanaians to engage in the downstream oil sector. Yeah. Add value. Mm. You know, it's all foreigners most of the time. So yeah, they make all the profits. Of course, they invested. So they made the profit and repatriate the profit. So they need to diversify. Yes, we, whatever we make from oil, invest some into a brick, into manufacturing, into road infrastructure, so that if one sector goes down, the other would survive. Um, in 2016, we saw Nigeria recorded a recession because they have focused too much on oil. When oil prices slumped, what mm -hmm. happened? Mm -hmm. They went into recession. Yep. If we rely solely on oil, we might face that recession or that problem. Yep. What we need to do is diversify. So a Greek, one sector goes down, another sector goes up. Currently, uh, post-COVID, a Greek has been resilient. Yep. Industry is picking up. But the oil and gas sector is going down. Okay. So the growth rate is negative. Okay. Uh, for the, the last quarter, what GDP could be we accounting saw. for that? Yes. Uh, because oil prices hasn't increased, yeah. uh, demand hasn't picked up. Probably the because of lockdowns. Lockdowns, and so all the aircrafts are not flying as much yeah. as possible, hotels mm -hmm. are not operating. So yeah. those, those are some of the, mm. the, the visions. Mm. Professor Peter Niaite Kote, he's my guest tonight. When I return from this break, he's also a lecturer, apart from being a director at ESEL. He's a lecturer. He'll be telling me what kind of a lecturer he is and the relationship he has with his students. Again, he'll be telling me uh, his experiences outside the country. We'll be making some comparison about the educational systems and see what we can bring on board to make ours better. Plus, we'll be talking about his family values and also talk about, you can see that he looks very fit. What does he do to keep fit? And also find out. Is it always economy, economy, figures, figures? What else does he do to relax? All of that after this break. Do stay with me. What's up, guys? My name is Sammy Forsen, host of the Weekend City Show and Ignition right here on Joy 99.7 FM. Well, anytime you happen to be busy and you miss out on your favorite shows right here on Joy FM, here's what you can do. Log on to myjoyonline.com forward slash podcast. Just go on there and you'll find all your shows on demand 24-7. There you can catch up. Remember, Joy FM remains your radio for discerning listeners. Welcome back to PM Personality Profile. My guest, so, uh, Professor Peter Corte, we are having um, an insight into his life and what he does as a development economist. Prof, let me ask you, what's your relationship with your students? I have a very good relationship with my students. You do? In fact, yes. Um, okay. Um, I, sometimes, um, because of COVID, but I, I, on Christmas, I organize a party. Okay. And they come home. I come, we, we have fun. We, I, I have that relationship with my students. I have some who today I call if I need something to be done in town. Mm. I have some who, um, they go on their PhDs, they contact me, we publish together. Okay. I, so I have very good relationship with, mm. with my mm. students. They, they say students are witches and wizards. Have you had your fair share? Some of them, when you... When they when they they pass, mm. they pass the exams. But when they fail, mm. it's the lecturer who failed them. Sometimes they can attack you physically, spiritually, anyhow. I mean, have you had your own experience? Um, no, because you see, when a student fails, it could be one or two things. It could be that the lecturer hasn't taught well. Mm -hmm. You haven't communicated well, or the student didn't learn. Okay. One or two things, mm -hmm. or both. Mm -hmm. Now, as a lecturer, I make sure I teach, you know, I teach. I also give them assignments. Some, before I start my, my lecture, I distribute topics okay. to a group of them, go and prepare and come and present mm -hmm. for the first 30 minutes presentation. After the presentation, they, they all ask questions. I also ask them questions, we discuss, then I give the lecture. Okay. And then in, in the course of the lecture, they can also ask me questions. So there's no way if you are, and I take attendance as well. Okay. So if you attended lectures and participated in class discussions, I don't see why 
you should fail. Mm. Once a while, some fail, uh, you know, but it's obvious. If somebody fails, then the person did not attend. I remember I had one uh, Afro-American. Um, she didn't attend enough lectures, so okay. uh, she failed. Mm. And I, I, I won't compromise that. She failed. Okay. Yeah, but when you mark scripts, I have a philosophy. There has to be normal distribution. Maybe some 5% getting low marks, another 5% getting A, High 5 to 10% getting A. Then the rest, the middle, the bulk middle, you get at the average or B plus. Mm. That should be your aim. If you've taught well, mm. once you examine, you should have that normal distribution. If you have a normal distribution, I don't see why any student will begrudge you or attack you. Mm. But sometimes if you don't, you come there and you even intimidate them. You come and you don't communicate well, you don't attend lectures properly, you don't do what it takes, you don't engage them in teaching and learning, discussions, uh, that, that is likely to happen. What would you describe as your worst moment as a lecturer? <laughs> as a lecturer, I, I don't recall uh, any, any such, you know, it's rather in research mm. that once a while you maybe either consultants you or something that the client is not too happy with the outcome. Okay. Uh, but quickly, you take take up the responsibility and make sure you address mm. the consultant's, uh, sorry, the client's uh, comments. But okay. as for teaching, I, I don't recall having had any issue with teaching. any student with teaching. You love what you do. I do. And you've never regretted no, no, not choosing at all. that. Not, not at all. <laughs> Initially, I wanted to be an accountant, chartered accountant, okay. but that didn't happen. But I think God really directed my path. Uh -huh. Because I look back and some of my mates are accountants, uh, you know, very seasoned, you know, well respected. But I think I'm enjoying okay. my profession. I get to meet people, I get to travel, I get to contribute to the economy. I, 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 I enjoy what I do. Okay. And, and I don't, if I should come back again, if there's reincarnation, I come back. I'll you do economist. it again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Mm. I mean, which of your kids uh, is towing your line? I wanted my first boy to do so, but I realized he was doing it to satisfy me. I told him <laughs> it wasn't his interest. It wasn't interest. his interest. Okay. Uh, he wanted to, but he wasn't excelling in the economy. Okay. So I, I told him, look. Um, he prefers the finance. Okay. He's combining finance and economic. Okay. Look, uh, take the finance okay. path. Uh, don't don't try to stress satisfy yourself. Stress yourself. Yourself. Over, yep. Yeah. Mm. But my third boy, mm. he's called also Peter. Peter Junior. Oh, in fact, he, okay. He he wants to uh, uh, follow Full that line. So I've told him we'll publish Peter and Peter Junior. We'll the publish. name has an influence. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> So I told him if he's interested and he chose that line, we'll be attending conferences together, you know, together and publishing. And he's quite excited to hear that. So oh, oh. Let's wait and see if if he would. He would so but I don't many? force them to okay. to take certain disciplines. Definitely. I advise them mm -hmm. and then and guide guide them. them. Great. I think that's for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of them? How I many have four, are they? I have four boys. Okay, four mm. boys. Yes. No yes. girl. No. Oh, wow. You must be a so strong they, they will, father. They give me the girls. What uh, kind of a father are you? Um, this one, if you ask them, they, they will tell you <laughs> the kind of father. Are you the strict type? I, I'm disciplined, but very, uh, you know, lo loving, I must say. They, okay. they, uh, I make sure they do what they have to do. But I, I show them love. I, I, you know, they will tell you. They, they, and you relate, you relate well with I them? I relate very well with them. So when they go and see some girls, do they come and tell you? Yeah. <laughs> they do? Well, I think I, I, when I see moves, I, I tell them I've seen you. You've been looking, there before. <laughs> before. And so, and they, they've been looking at you. I say, hey, I've been a child before, so I know. <laughs> you know but we, we relate uh, pretty well. And okay. You see, I have very good boys. Okay. Because some, when you say you have four boys, hey, how yes, do you manage? Yes, of course. They'll be... Here, you don't even know they are home. They are human beings yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, as okay. I speak, one is inside now. He's, he's just finished oh. investing. Oh, wow. Uh, they, they, they are fine. They, they are cool. Mm. You know, they are mm. very respectful. Mm. And they, they, all of them play the piano. You know, so at church, they play one instrument or the other. Okay. They, 
Yeah, they are fine. So during your time at school, when you were getting all those scholarships and you were that sharp, hmm. were the girls following you? I think they will. <laughs> well, I, I related to them. They also related to me. So we, <laughs> we have, actually, I got my wife from Accra Academy. Oh, so, yes, tell that's, me that's, about yeah. so, that. Yeah, um, that's, that's how it works. You know, okay. Once you know... So, is she the one who gave you the scholarship or you went to follow her? Or how did it happen? I don't think there was a scholarship. I think it was a mutual uh, agreement. The, agreement. The feeling was mutual. So, but How did you first meet? Um, she came to live in a, I think they visit the sister okay. in that area. So, a friend said, uh, there's this lady from, who attends Accra Academy, who's moved to, or visited, you know, she spent a bit of time there. Okay. So I said, well, I'll go and see her. So I, I went to meet her and then we introduced each other. Uh -huh. we, we introduced ourselves. Okay. Um, I was then in upper six and she was in lower six. Uh -huh. So that's uh -huh. how the friendship started. And okay. One thing led to the other. And the rest, and is, the rest history. is history. <laughs> history. Is yeah. But I see that you, you look very fit, even though you do a lot of research and uh, probably you have to spend long hours sitting, typing and all that. I still look fit. What do you do to keep fit? In terms of fitness, I, there are times I, I, I do the, the uh, walking, uh, jogging, mm -hmm. because uh, my doctor says at a certain age, you shouldn't be jogging, you know, running, because, um, it's, I mean, you could use the treadmill, but you also have to be careful. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want a situation where you might trip or get be, into yeah, but he says yeah. walking that's what walking is the safest you can't go wrong you can't go it. wrong it's the yeah. safest way yeah you know, because there could be a morning where you wake up and maybe things are not well you don't know mm -hmm. you start jogging and, and then by the time you realize something, uh, something happens happened. but that's what walking is the safest so i yeah. i do a lot of walking, walking. Uh, sometime in the morning uh, normally from here to the garage Mm. 45 minutes okay. every morning. Mm. That's time I do morning, evening. Uh, I also make sure at work, I get out and if I want to go to the bank, I walk to the, bank. to the ATM. I mean, on campus. On campus, okay. I walk to the ATM, mm. go and take money. Mm. And uh, that, that's, you know, but it's not just about exercise, it's also the food you eat. Yes. Uh, my dietitian tells me I should cut down carbohydrates. I used to be bigger than this. Okay, yes. My carbohydrates, how much carbo you take. Yep few something less carbohydrate more vegetables, vegetables. so and that that also helps okay. uh, quite a lot okay okay so, he's done quite good for you yeah, because you're yeah. looking very healthy ah, thank you. but yeah. i know you also enjoy some music in your mm. quiet time it's not always playing with figures right oh yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I like uh, all the joe metal uh, songs I, I i like them i also like um come now come nice be a quiet mommy you know okay the Okay. The mm. mm. you know, that, that, that I like. I like that. Mm. Shako DS music is also quite. You know, sometimes I want to feel a bit funky. Which one? Which one? I I I, I can't. A, any any of any of them. Any of Shako DS is also. Kujuenchi is is quite good. Okay. I, I enjoy Kujuenchi. You know the song. Okay. okay. Kojenshi is a great guy, but do I get to walk with you? Yes, I mean, sir. so viewers, uh, Prof says he's going to walk with me. I'm going to follow him and see what he does when he's walking. And whilst you're walking, I'm sure you meditate and you think about a lot of things yes, exactly. and plan your day. That's what I'm going to do with him. I'm going to follow him. Let me thank you so much, Professor Ni Aite. Forty today we brought it out of the box. Yes, the yes, we have unlocked the box. Thank yeah. you so much for allowing us into your home. We really, really appreciate uh, your efforts in helping develop the country. Keep up the good work, viewers. Thank you so much for watching. Um,
same time next week we'll be bringing you another exciting edition of PM Personality Profile. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Enjoy the rest of our programs. <laughs>